Welcome to Spring One, and thank you for joining us in our session on building highly scalable spring applications within memory data grids. My name is John Bloom, and with me today I have my good friend and colleague, Luke Shannon. We both work for Pivotal. We're both Apache Geo committers. Additionally, I've actually worked on Gemfire for over four years as an engineer, and I'm currently the Spring Data Gemfire lead. Today we'll be talking to you about a technology called Apache Geode, what it is, how it works, and more importantly, how Spring can be used to build highly scalable Apache Geode applications. We'll kind of break things down a little bit, talk about some of the fundamental concepts of distributed systems and memory, in memory databases and how that applies to Apache Geode. And then we'll give you an overview of Spring Data Gemfire. I have some demos to present for you. Luke's got a fantastic presentation that really or demo that really uh, illustrates all the Spring technologies from Spring Boot to Spring support for web sockets, coupled with a lot of the Apache Geode features. And then we'll kind of cover what's new in Spring Data Gemfire. And then uh, we'll have uh, some Q&A. So let's get started. So why is a technology like Apache Geode important? Three reasons, really. Uh, volume of data. I think everybody here would agree that the amount of information that we capture and retain today has vastly increased. It's partly due to the amount of devices that are connected to our applications from mobile devices to sensors. GE, for instance, actually generates something like 300 gigabytes of data per flight every day. And when you consider all the different flights, how many times a plane flies, that's a lot of data. Um, subsequently, given all the number of devices and uh, sensors and other things that are connected, generating data, the rate of events that occur have vastly increased as well. So it's very important to have both accuracy and real-time capabilities to be able to process that information um, to derive meaningful and actionable business results. So what is Apache Geode? Kind of in a nutshell, it's the open source core of Piddle Gemfire. If anybody here has ever worked with Piddle Gemfire, um, then you kind of know what Apache Geode is already. But Pivotal Gemfire was open sourced by Pivotal and submitted to the Apache Software Foundation, and it's currently in incubating status. So it's just the open source core of Pivotal Gemfire right now. But that doesn't really tell you what Apache Geode is, so we'll drill into that a little bit more. So in a nutshell, or more specifically, Apache Geode is a distributed in-memory compute and data management platform that can elastically scale in order to achieve high throughput, low latency access to both big and fast data to power both business critical and analytical applications in real time. That's, that's quite a loaded definition, um, but there's some key elements in there that are applicable to actually building highly scalable application. The first one being scaling. Uh, t traditionally, applications have scaled up. You know, you've added more CPU, more memory, faster disk. But in addition to that, now we see architectures that are scaling out horizontally. And when you add nodes, you can subtract nodes, but when you add more nodes, your throughput increases. The number of operations you accomplish per second increases linearly with the number of nodes that you add to your cluster. Under the hood, Apache Geode uses highly concurrent, optimized, in-memory data structures to, remove, to reduce both contention and as well as context switching in your application threads. So some common use cases for Apache Geode, it can be used as a system of record as your database in your application that has ACID properties. Um, in addition to that, it also supports local as well as global or GTA based transactions, has features such as indexing, queries, functions, and it can even write data to disk. It's also a key value store, so it can be used as a caching provider. It implements a lot of this, you know, characteristics of a cache, like eviction, expiration, overflow, right, through, right behind, those, those sort of capabilities. We have a module to support HTTP session replication uh, for Tomcat in particular. There's already work underway to support, actually, H, um, spring session as Gemfire with an adapter. It can serve as a, a L2 cache and hibernate. 
It implements the memcache protocol so memcache clients can talk directly to a geode server. It can also be used as a message bus. It's an event-driven architecture with both guaranteed and rely, uh, asynchronous message delivery. And put simply, it's actually just a glorified version of the concurrent hash map. So some of the data structures in Geode actually implement concurrent map, and you can use them that way in your applications. One particular use case um, specifically is the China Railway Corporation. They had something like 72 different servers um, running Unix and database systems that just couldn't, couldn't quite meet the demand of their users. They had like 1.45 billion page views a day with 20 million users, 4.5 million uh, ticket sales. At peak times, they had reached like 15,000 different uh, ticket sales per second, or per minute, excuse me. So their system just couldn't handle that load anymore. They would have timeouts, their application would be sporadic, they'd lose transactions. So they replaced that with approximately 10 different Gemfire servers um, having about two terabytes of data. And they noticed increased throughput, lower latency, um, basically reliable system overall. More information about this use case and others can be found on Pivotal's website about Pivotal Gemfire. Um, some of those are referenced on the Apache Geode uh, site as well. So how does Apache Geode work under the hood? Well, first and foremost, it stores your data in memory, and specifically on the JVM heap. There will be some upcoming features of Apache Geode and Pivotal Gemfire where you'll have the ability to store data in off-heap memory as well. Uh, that's currently on the roadmap and should be in our next release. Apache Geode also functions as a distributed system or an in-memory data grid, which means that it pools system resources across multiple nodes in a cluster to manage both application state and behavior. Um, your resources, of course, be in memory, CPU, network, and optionally disk. So like I mentioned before, Apache Geode can persist information to disk and as well overflow information to disk. So once that memory or once you reach capacity of memory, it starts over overflowing your data to disk. It writes to a proprietary format, uh, an op log, which is an append-only file. Um, and over time, there's a lot of garbage in there that needs to be basically condensed, so compaction is necessary. And then an additional feature will eventually be to write that data to HDF direct, HDFS directly as well. So we'll focus in on memory management a little bit because that's very important in, an app, in, a, in a system like Apache Geode. It's important to manage your memory appropriately. Otherwise, you can run into auto memory errors and such. So there's different ways in which Apache Geode manages memory. First and foremost, you can use some of the caching capabilities such as eviction. We use the least recently used algorithm. And we also have configurable expiration using uh, time to live, idle timeout. That means that when an entry in the cache uh, remains idle and hasn't been accessed for a period of time, it's evicted or it's expired, excuse me. And then there's an overall duration in which the item can live in the cache as well, and that's your time to live. There's a resource manager which actually has both a critical and an eviction heat percentage thresholds. So once you've reached capacity on your heap, um, a certain percentage of the capacity of the heap, it starts evicting entries using the LRU algorithm. And if you reach the critical threshold, it'll actually prevent cache write operations. It also uses data compression using Snappy out of the box. You can actually plug in other different compression schemes if you, if you, if you will. Um, I think the numbers are right around 50% reduces the uh, data um, pressure by 50% or the memory capacity. And then you just can't really escape JVM GC tuning. At some point, because that data is stored in memory, you're going to have to tune your JVM. There's no escaping that. So where do you begin with something like Apache Geode? How do you start building an application with Apache Geode? Well, you start with a single data node. You start up a server. You add some regions. In a cache, the region, or excuse me, in a cache, the, the cache is divided up into what's called regions. You can think of those as like database tables in a relational database that maybe correspond to individual application domain objects. They're just key value stores and there's different types of regions in which you can put your information into, replicated, partitioned, and so on. But these are just a couple distributed regions. 
Now you might start up a CAS server so you can connect a client, and optionally you could also start up an application with an embedded cache. And so your application is literally a peer in that distributed system. However, what happens about load? You have a single node here, um, and you start adding more and more clients. Eventually, he's going to run out of memory and he's going to crash. So then you form a cluster of nodes in this distributed system. And you start replicating that data across multiple nodes. And they're all joined by what's called a locator in Apache Geode. Now, Apache Geode can actually use multicast networking, but a more effective means is to use a locator. And I'll explain a little bit more about the locator in just a minute here. But the data is replicated across all the nodes. So now we've scaled out. We've achieved a high availability. We've made our data more accessible to a, on a broader range of nodes in the cluster. So if one fails, it's resilient. It's a shared nothing architecture, so each node operates independently. If one fails, the other ones just pick up the tab, they take over, and uh, the system remains resilient to failures. You can actually add disk stores here, so you can make it persistent. It becomes durable that way, in addition to being replicated. So the durability is kind of achieved through both replication and as well as persistence. And then your clients talk directly to the locator rather than individual servers. And this, this actually achieves three different things. First, it achieves load balancing. The locator keeps metadata about which nodes in the cluster are, most, uh, are least loaded and most loaded. And it can direct clients directly to the least loaded servers. This is also useful in situations where maybe a node fails the connection pool will automatically fail over and pick up a new server that actually has the client's data of interest. And then finally, once the, loc or once, excuse me, once the client connects to the locator, it'll actually determine which nodes in the cluster have it, has its data and it'll connect directly to those servers. And that way it achieves single hop access and lower latency that way. But, in this particular scenario, we've achieved high throughput because we've replicated our data across all the nodes. So we've got a copy of all of our data across all those nodes. But what about writes? If we have to write a value to the cache, that value has to go to every single replicate. And if you have a lot of nodes in your cluster, that can take quite a while. So it's more optimal to actually create what's called a partition region. This is the same thing as called sharding your data. So Certain members contain certain subsets of the data, so a, a partition region, and I'll have a slide here that shows it in a minute, is sort of a logical view of that region. And that region is distributed across multiple members. There's a redundancy level you can set. I can say that I want, my, I want like X number of copies of my partition region, and that region's divided up into buckets. And by default, Apache Geode uses the hashing algorithm, so it hashes by key, and it determines based on the number of nodes in your cluster where that particular data element goes. Now, as I mentioned, there's redundancy, so you can create you know, duplicate copies of buckets of the partition region, up to two. It actually supports only two um, buckets. You can actually control partitioning. There's a partition resolver, so you can control kind of where your data goes. And that's important in cases where maybe you need co-location. So Apache Geo doesn't dis support distributed joins, so it's important to actually co-locate data. Like, say, you have customers, you have some accounts or orders tied to that particular customer, you want to run a query across multiple data sets, then it's important to actually co-locate that data. So we've achieved now, we've achieved high read and write throughput because the data is being written to specific nodes that contains that data. But what about consistency? How does consistency factor into something like Apache Geode? Well, that's where our partition comes into play. So as I said, the partition region is a logical view, and it contains specific data elements on specific members within that region. But the concept of the primary region actually consists of two things. It consists of a primary and secondaries. And all writes channel through the primary first. And it also uses a, a scoping policy for acknowledgment called distributed ACK. So when it does a write, it expects that when an element's written to the cache, that it receives acknowledgment from each of the secondaries or each of the redundant copies in order to guarantee that that data element's been updated. So what happens if one of my nodes goes down? No worries. 
Apache Geode has automatic rebalancing. It'll reshuffle your data. And actually, Luke's going to demonstrate that in his demo. Um, and as well, it'll actually restore redundancy. So in my scenario there, I had a, all the dark colored objects, uh, uh, rectangles there were the primaries. And the lightly colored ones of the similar color were the secondaries. Essentially, other nodes in the cluster pick up the tab. So the secondaries, one of the secondaries becomes the primary. And then it restores redundancy by actually shifting the secondaries to other nodes. So when you lose members in a distributed system, in order to maintain consistency, you've now got what we call a split brain or a partition in the network. And you've got two different kind of independent clusters going on. So that's not good for consistency. Well, so what Apache Geo does is it basically determines a losing, a losing side based on a quorum algorithm and shuts that other side down. So all the members in the system are actually weighted. There's actually three different types of weightings. The locator gets a, a value of five. Normal servers that contain data get a weight of 10. And then there's a coordinator in the, in, the, in the distributed system. He's usually generally the eldest member in the distributed system, usually the node that you start first. He gets a weight of 15. And using those weighted values and all the members in the distributed system, it does a calculation to determine what's the winning side and what's the losing side. And then that losing side essentially gets cut off from the rest of the, the system, and clients can no longer access it. They can only access that subset that survived that has the greater weighting at that point. The other members, they go into what's called an auto-reconnect state. So they'll sit there and they'll try to reestablish a connection back to the cluster. And maybe it just had a, a temporary network glitch, right? So you know, maybe the system actually comes back online, and then they're able to connect. So then Gemfire or Apache Geo actually performs what's called a fence and merge operation. So while, that, while those members have been off, sort of disconnected from the distributed system, they need to be updated. They need to be resynced with the rest of the cluster because their data may be out of sync. So they're fenced off, and then there's basically operations that have occurred to actually bring those members back into, into to sync with the rest of the cluster, and then they become accessible again. And not all that happens automatically, so Geode is basically taking care of that for you behind the scenes. So you don't have to worry about any of that. So that's one of the key features of, of Apache Geode is this network partition resolution um, strategy and policies. So finally, we have sort of different architectures or topologies in which Apache Geode supports. Of course, we have your in embedded cache scenarios, your application embedded scenarios. They can be tiered, so you can tier them up. You can embed Gemfire in your application within, say, a container. And then you can geo-disperse your clusters, so you can have one cluster in one data center, another cluster in another data center, and use WAN capabilities to basically connect the two and uh, keep multiple sites sort of in sync there. So just a summary of what we kind of talked about. You know, Apache Geo's in memory, it's distributed. We scale out, it's high throughput. We really strive to achieve low predictable latencies. Highly available when your data is replicated across the cluster. There's multiple copies of it. And we really, Apache Geo was actually built from the ground up to be very strict consistency. So any moment that you know, a member goes down or you know, something can't be reconciled, then uh, consistency is definitely a priority. It's be definitely durable, you know, given that we replicate and we uh, persist data and is very fault tolerant. Some of the other features of Apache Geode, we support data serialization out of the box, both Java IO serial, um, serializable, but we also have our own serialization format called PDX. It's actually called Portable Data Exchange, and it's sort of a coincidence because Gemfire was built in um, Portland, Oregon, and uh, that's our airport uh, symbol, PDX. Kind of interesting tidbit there. It supports things like delta propagation. So rather than distributing all the data to all the different nodes, it actually just distributes the delta, like what's changed. And PDX is one of the features that makes that sort of thing possible. PDX is also, you know, gives you the advantage of not deserializing your data and when you're doing things like queries as well. So that's very um, important in, in uh, efficiency. I mentioned that it supports transactions, both local and JTA. We have querying. We have continuous queries. So 
There's a couple features in Apache Geode, um, Gemfire. One's register interest. This was our old architecture for basically for a client to basically express its interest in what data sets it's interested in. So it expresses it through keys or key values, a, reg a regular expression, and it gets updates for those particular keys. Well, there's a newer feature called continuous queries where I write something like a SQL statement with a predicate that determines the updates that I get that satisfy the, uh, the where clause or the predicate in the query. Much more flexible. We have functions, which are equivalent to stored procedures. We support native clients, C++, C Sharp. And more recently, we actually have a REST API, so we can actually have any language client, whether it be Python, Scala, Ruby, also talk to Apache Geode. Uh, there's management man monitoring capabilities, security, authorization, um, authentication, as well as secure transport. But there's no disk-based encryption yet. We get asked that question a lot, but there is no data, uh, secure data at rest. Usually that's protected through firewalls or hardware appliances and stuff like that. And statistics and logging, so we have Log4j as our logging implementation, makes it highly more configurable than our ODE format, which was proprietary. So now on to Spring Data Gemfire. So why Spring Data Gemfire? Well, when you think of something like Apache Geode and what it is, this statement's really applicable. Simple things should be simple, and complex things should be possible. With something like a distributed system or Apache Geode, you can get into trouble real fast because of all the different configuration options, uh, the topologies, the timing of events, and all that stuff. So Apache Geode tries to, or excuse me, Spring Data Genfire really tries to boil that down for you. So it applies Spring's powerful non-invasive programming model to simplify both configuration and development of applications. Plus it allows Apache Geode or Pivotal Gemfire to bridge the gap with other Spring technologies, namely Spring's cache abstraction. It can be used in RESTful-based applications. So because Spring Data Gemfire actually implements repositories, if you're familiar with Spring Data Commons repositories, you can actually apply a RESTful app, uh, interface on top of your applications through repositories. It also integrates with Spring integration as both inbound and outbound channel adapters, some, some of the features of, of of Apache Geode can serve as both a source of information as well as a destination. And like I said, there's an upcoming Spring mo session module to support Apache Geode. And of course in Spring XD, because it's built on Spring integration, there's sources and syncs there that also use Apache Geode. If you look through the documentation, you'll see that. More specifically about the cache abstraction, when you combine Apache Geode with Spring's cache abstraction, and Spring Data Gemfire positions Geode as a caching provider, and it will automatically support JSR 107, or more specifically, the caching annotations. There's three primary use cases that come up quite frequently when using Spring Data Gemfire. First, you can just use Spring Data Gemfire to configure Apache Geode. So Apache Geode, or Pivotal Gemfire, actually has its own format for configuration. It's in a cache XML file. It's native to, uh, specific to Spring, um, excuse me, Apache Geode. But you can use Spring Data Gemfire XML or Java config to actually replace cache XML as your configuration means. And we'll see some examples of that in just a minute. Um, there's also a cluster-based configuration service. So you can think of that as sort of your golden schema in a database. Every time you make a change and you've tested that and you've run that through different uh, test cycles, you cut a new golden schema. Cluster configuration is kind of serves that function in that role. So using our command line tools, you can make changes to the cluster, add a region, create an index. It's recording those changes, and it's creating what's called sort of a golden schema that gets rolled out to all the different um, nodes when new members join the cluster. And you can actually combine that with Spring Config to push out Spring Config instead of Cache XML. By default, it's using Gem Geode's uh, native configuration format. As you've seen in my uh, getting kind of where you begin section, you can create an application that embeds a cache directly into it. There's some advantages to that, but there's also disadvantages. The advantage being that your application's closely located to the data that it might be operating on. But there's other means to achieve that, such as function execution. Um, so you kind of have to be wary of whether you're embedding the cache in your application, because that's actually going to create additional pressure on the JVM heap, right? Your access patterns in your application are going to differ from uh, the access patterns that are within Geode itself. The more traditional architecture, of course, is your client server. So you have a client cache that connects to 
perhaps a standalone cluster. Some of the other features, I kind of briefly talked about those. The, uh, the repository support supports your basic CRUD operations uh, as well as querying. You have function implementation and execution implemented by way of annotations in Spring Data Gemfire. If you look at the, uh, the original programming model for creating functions in, in uh, Apache Geode, it's very kind of dated. I mean, you have to extend a lot of interfaces, implement a lot of classes in order to implement that. Spring Data Gemfire basically removes all their boilerplate and allows you to accomplish that via annotations and basic POJO methods on, uh, on uh, or excuse me, basic uh, methods on POJO classes. Luke will have some more concrete examples of this as we uh, progress here. Of course, it ties in with the exception translation uh, in Spring Data um, exception hierarchy there, the data access exception hierarchy, which makes it more conducive to working with the trans transaction infrastructure. I mentioned register interests and continuous queries on the client, um, the WAN support, data snapshots, a bunch of different things. We'll talk about those more as we get into some of the examples. Real quick, this is just the coordinates in which you can get um, Apache Geode through Spring Data Gemfire. So by default, Spring Data Gemfire works with Pivotal Gemfire, but there's actually a version, and that's the specific version there that allows you to actually work with Spring and Apache Geode together. Right now, it's just in a snapshot version because officially, Apache Geode hasn't been released yet. Um, we haven't had our first release with Apache Geode. So how do you configure? As I mentioned, you can do it either through XML or Java-based configuration. I'll show you a quick example in just a minute. And bootstrapping can be accomplished several different ways. You can do it either through Spring Boot or you can do it on the command line in GFish. There's a new option as of like Gemfire 8 called Spring XML Location, which kind of corresponds to the cache XML file. So you can either use native config or you can specify some Spring config. And that takes a Spring perspective. So it starts a Spring container, a Spring container which in turn bootstraps Gemfire. Well, let's jump over to an example real quick. Get into the good stuff now. So in its simplest form, you might have some configuration that just looks like this. All you really need is to have a cache. This doesn't have any regions or anything. It's just a plain old cache. You need to actually start a member. And there's some properties there, some basic properties. Those are system properties in Gemfire. You can name your node. You can set your log level. And by default, I've actually turned MCAST off by setting the port to zero. Also, I haven't specified any locators. So this is just a loner. All he's going to do is start up and be sort of an empty shell. So he's not very interesting. However, you can start doing more interesting things. I can create a cache. I can specify some additional Gemfire properties. In addition to the name, MCAS port, I can specify a locator I want to connect to. And if I'm developing an application I want to get going quickly, I can just embed that locator right within my server. So servers can actually start an embedded locator, which means that I can actually connect to it using our tooling, or I can actually start another member that's going to connect to this member. So I can start writing kind of like in the microservices architecture, little mini applications with their own data store embedded and, uh, and connect them all up. Additionally here, I'm actually starting a manager on a specific port, and I'm making sure that the manager starts on startup. I've actually defined a cache server. I've defined a region. It's partitioned in this particular case. It's not persistent. And some of the more interesting things about it, I've actually configured a cache listener, which actually is just going to log entries when I actually put stuff into the cache. And I've actually configured a cache loader. So on cache misses, Geo's going to actually go through and try to read a value from an external data source. And you can imagine this data source or this cache loader being configured with, like, say, a database data source, right? I could configure that in Spring, and I could actually inject that data source into my, um, my cache loader. And you could use things like Spring Data JPA. Pretty much the sky's the limit. Whatever you could imagine, you could accomplish through dependency injection here in Spring. A similar configuration. This same configuration can be expressed in Java config such as this. 
I might have some actually application specific properties, so these aren't gemfire specific, but I'm going to actually use property placeholders in Spring to inject those properties maybe into gemfire components like the regions, uh, like the initial capacity for the region, maybe a load factor, things like that, or even on the server, setting the max number of connections, its port, and so on. I have my same gemfire properties. I create a cache. I'm using those property placeholders to set some values, like the resource manager. The moment I set critical heap uh, and eviction heap percentages, then the resource manager kicks in automatically. If I don't set those values, then it won't use the resource manager. I've got my cache server defined. We have the example region that's being created. You can actually create metadata about your region in terms of like some of the configuration settings, your load factor, your initial capacity, that sort of thing. There's many other settings, including cache loaders and writers, transaction listeners, and so on, that actually can be set through region attributes. And then I just have my cache listener and loader. So let's see this in action. Oh, let's see here. Bootstrap. Source. So I've got logging turned up in this particular case so we can kind of see everything that's happening during startup. This is just a basic Spring, app, Spring Boot application. And it's using that Java config to basically wire up the container and configure Gemfire, or excuse me, Pivotal um, Apache Geode in this case. You can see that it's actually creating a locator. It's going through some discovery to try to determine if there's any other members out there. It's going to create my region. Uh-oh. Do I already have something running? One second here. Sorry about this. Yes. I have that running. Got quite a bit running here. All right, let's just make sure nothing else is running. Okay. I definitely had something else running. So what happened there is when I started up either the CAS server or the manager, that port was already bound and in use. So it actually looked like it started up. So maybe either the manager or the CAS server within the within the distributed system can start up. It's actually just a separate service within Geode. Let's see if we can get it going this time. All right. Oops. So it looks like I'm running. So just as proof, Pivotal Gemfire is actually in release 8.2. The actual Apache Geode release number is 100 incubating snapshot. So I am indeed using Apache Geode here as the server. Back in GFish, I'm actually going to use Gemfire Shell. So essentially, Gemfire and Apache Geode are interoperable. You can actually run both, and they can talk to each other and do all that stuff. So I've got the shell running here. I don't have any members because I'm not connected yet. So let's connect. Now, my locator, if you look at my configuration, Look at the Gemfire configuration here. It was on port 11.235. Um, you can connect either directly to the locator, and subsequently, that'll actually reconnect directly to the back to the JMX manager. Or you could connect to the JMX manager here, just to keep it simple. It's going to connect to the locator. Typically, people use the default port, which is 10.334. I like to change it up. OK, so now I'm connected. I can see the members in the distributed system. I can see the name of my member here. I can actually describe that member, see some more useful information about him. We have tab completion here. So you can see, again, the name, the IP address that he's running on. You can see that he's got a region and that he's hosting a cache server and the port that I configured that on. So let's list the regions here. We have one. You can describe it. And you can see my settings for initial capacity, 
The data policy here in this case is partition. I created it as a partition region. We have our, our cache loader and our cache listener. So the cache listener, again, is gonna log events as I'm putting data into the cache. And the loader, in this particular case, just creates a timestamp. So if I access any arbitrary key, it's just gonna drain a t a generate a key value with a timestamp in it. So first, we're gonna put a value into the region. So you can see here the operation was successful. That was true, so I can get that back out. You can see the value, of course. And the value, indeed, is test. Um, now I can just start getting random values, actually. And then my uh, timestamp cache loader is going to kick in. And like I said before, you could imagine that actually being some uh, data source that you could configure and pull that information from a database or even some uh, network resource. So I can add a few values there. And if I go back into my IDE and I look at the um, things that just happened, you'll see in addition to the commands that have been executing in GFish, like list members, describing a member, and so on, you'll also see that I uh, logged those events. First, my key value one associated with test, and then the, just the random timestamps that were generated. So that's just a real simple example of configuring and using Spring to bootstrap Apache Geode. Now Luke's gonna actually show you a much more exciting demo with all the Spring features that I mentioned before. Right now. Right now, this right second. Now. Okay. All right. Yeah. Can you use this dongle? Yeah, I think so. Okay. All right, so I didn't get here earlier to do the AV test, so let's see how this goes. Okay, so what I want to show you guys is um, an application um, that is totally built from a spring point of view. That's way easier. OK, um, so the GitHub repo uh, that this is based upon, uh, John has it in the presentation, but we basically have something called Pivotal Open Source Hub. And within open, Pivotal Open Source Hub, there is a geo demo application. Um, so everything for this application is contained here. Uh, so that includes all the logic for the application, all the logic deployed to Geode, all the configurations, and even all the shell scripts to actually start, stop, and manage the cluster. Uh, and as I said, it's totally taken from a Spring point of view, so it uses Spring Boot, uh, Spring XML to configure. So let's get, kind of get into that now. So um, let's see if I can just zoom up. So if you go to the main page of the repo, it actually walks you through the flow. Um, now, with this demo application, we're going to be working with the entire cluster on one machine. But before I get into that, what I thought I would just quickly show you is what the cluster looks like if it's actually running in full distributed mode. Um, so this is Amazon EC2. Um, basically, I've got a couple of machines. They're the R38X large. So this was for a proof of concept I did that had a lot of data. So I needed fairly beefy machines. But really, all you need is uh, machines that have the high gigabit uh, network for network communication. And then you put them in the same kind of zone. And then you can actually configure and have them all talk to each other. And 
We'll walk through the configuration uh, in a second, but I just wanted to show you what it looks like in distributed mode. So this is something called Pulse, and it's a web application that ships with Gemfire that just gives you a view of what your distributed machine looks like. So each one of these is a server, and each one of the circles is actually a Java process. So some are locators, some are servers, and they're all kind of communicating together. So in total, I have 10 members with eight servers, um, two locators, for a total of 240 uh, gigabytes. For data, I only have one region, and that region has um, 10,000 entries, and they're spread across eight members. So uh, if I mouse over here, um, you can see they're kind of each uh, region has its own sort of set of members. And I have a redundancy of two, meaning this count that shows per member, per member it's only for the primary copy. So if I actually come along and um, uh, kill this, oh, broken pipe, OK. So what I'm going to do is log into one of these SSH servers. That's the thing with Amazon. It kind of drops your connections pretty frequently. Uh, so I'm just going to go in here to the Ubuntu package, into scripts. I'm going to run gfish. Um, so I'm going to connect by locator to one of the locators running in the Amazon cluster. And I've actually just put um, the IP of the guy I want to connect to here. So I can list members. There's all my members. So what I want to actually do is stop a server by name. And we'll just pick one of these guys at random. So 92, server 2. So I'm just going to issue the command of the distributed system to shut that member down. And what you'll see, which is kind of interesting, is it drops to seven members. And there'll kind of be a shuffling around of members and um, data to retain the numbers. So you can see how the shapes kind of change. That's the actual system saying, OK, we lost a member, but we've got all these copies. So let's shift some of these secondary copies to primaries and rebalance the cluster. Uh, so that all happens on the fly. And I thought I'd just show you, you know, how that looked from a distributed system. But for the purposes of the demo application I want to share with you, everything actually runs on a remote machine. Uh, so I'm just going to clear, or sorry, on a local machine. So I'm just going to clear this particular window. So this project is broken down into a couple of pieces. So if you download it, you can go into this demo folder. And the demo folder has two sort of subfolders. So one is single machine mode. So this is a set of scripts you can use that, to actually start up a geode cluster running on your machine. It's only going to work on Macs or Linux, uh, Mac or Linux at this, uh, this time. I'm going to redo this example with some bat files in the future. Um, this geode server package, this contains all the dependencies and everything we need to start and manage the cluster. But that geode server package is also what I could push up to a remote server, like an AWS instance. And it actually has everything I need to start up a member on a distributed machine. Uh, but single machine mode, it's actually just going to start all the processes for a cluster on this same machine. So if we go back to the main screen, I've kind of got a flow to sort of walk you through everything. We'll just do that right now. So there's a command called start demo. So what Start demo does is a couple of things. It starts up a standalone Derby DB because what this application shows is write through. So it shows if I put an entry into the cluster, it can be written through to a database. So it starts up a Derby DB just locally. And then what it does is it's going to start up a cluster. So it starts up um, two locators and four servers on my local machine. So let's take a quick peek while that's starting up, how that looks. So if you go into demo, uh, Geode package. So in this geode package, you'll see there's a geode snapshot. So that's something I got from John. There's a lib directory, which all the logic that the geode server process might need while it's running is here. This is its class path. And for my config, you'll see here is how I configured the server. So I'm using PDX serialization, meaning when I give a Java object to this cluster, it's going to store it using PDX serialization. 
And actually, for different sort of project work, I've actually showed reading those same objects with a .NET application. So it makes the objects in the cluster interchangeable across languages. Um, you'll see I've configured my data source. So that's my Derby database. I've got regions. You'll notice there's sort of cache writers and transactions. We'll get into each of these momentarily. But if we come back here, the application has started up. Now you'll see some other output that sort of looks like stack traces, and it actually isn't. After the cluster started, so you'll see I called a gfish command, and, and it lists, uh, listed some things here. Um, those are all the members. It then started up a Spring Boot app that connects to the Geode cluster as a client and feeds a bunch of data into it. So what I've done is included that. If you come here, you'll see there's a project called Fast Fetchers Historic Data. Now, before we do that, let's actually take a step back and let's take a look at sort of a critical piece of this, and this is the domain model. So within the project, um, let me just close all these. Within the project, you'll see there is a fast foot shoes model, and these are our domain objects. So here's one of them. This is our transaction object. So this actually has a bunch of objects nested within it. And every time there's a sale on this sort of online store, one of these objects is generated and put into the geode cluster. Now, the only difference between this and your sort of average run-of-the-mill POJO is a couple of annotations. So there's one called at region. And this specifies the region in geo that this is going to go in. And then I have an annotation, which is ID. And that specifies the key. So why I'm doing this is I want to use uh, these repositories. So creating a repository, if I want to do CRUD operations against Geode, it's just as simple as creating an interface that extends this Gemfire repository um, interface here. And you'll see my keys are strings. And my values are alert objects. But what I can do, let's say for this transaction, if we look at the transaction repository, I can do some much more interesting things. So you'll see I've got some OQL queries here. And um, let's say I want to get a collection of transactions where the order is open. I can actually just on this method define my query. And that query will be executed in Geode. So if you want to see how that would look, we can actually take this query and come back here. So what I'm going to do inside of um, single node mode, there's a gfish shell script. And what this does is creates a gfish session. Now, because I'm running locally and I have all the defaults, I can just say connect. And it's going to assume there's a locator connected, connectable uh, locally. Um, and there is, because I'm running everything locally. So those are all the members running on my particular machine within the cluster. And if I take this query, so this is a query from the repository. Um, so you'll see there's no records because we don't actually have any objects that have that property. But if we take a look at one where it's shipped, you'll see there's quite a few. And it's actually paging for me. And what I could actually do is just maybe limit this by 10, and then just see you know, 10 objects that met that criteria. So you got a pretty robust query language. Um, and you can just put them inside of the repository, as you see here. Functions are another way. And we're going to see what, what that's like in a second. Now, the other thing I did is in the class path of this model object, I created uh, an XML config called client cache. So what client cache does is it defines a client side configuration for connecting to the cluster. So this has a number of regions. Um, and it's got uh, locators. It's assuming they're local host at a certain port. Now, what's neat is if you look at that historic data loader, so you know, Spring Boot is by far the best way to create a Gemfire client application. Because Spring Boot gives me this nice sort of main method or main class I can run. And what I can just do is import the resource. So off the class path, I'm getting that XML I just showed you. Because the fast foot shoes model is part of the class path of this application. So as soon as this app starts up, it actually loads that XML, which results in a connection to the remote cluster, which results in this Spring Boot application having it now a client cache that's actually connected with Geode. And then I can run this nice 
data loader method. So Spring Bean has this nice command line runner um, class where you can just sort of wire in a bean and have it execute as soon as things initialize. And if you scroll down on this method, what I basically do is in the class path of this historic data loader, I have some CSVs. So what I do is iterate through the CSVs and basically create objects. And let me find a place where I write them in. Here you can see I do a write. So I create the objects. I have a list. I build up about 10. And then I do a save as a list. And that's much more efficient from a networking point of view to send them sort of in batches as opposed to one at a time. So this is a really, you know, with Spring Boot, you can just quickly provide or create these clients that perform quick operations or, you know, put things into the cluster, get things out, execute functions. So it's a great, great programming model. Um, so the other thing to quickly look at, and we'll look at it here in the cluster, or the GitHub, is how I started the cluster. Um, so what I do here is I do everything all in one shot. Oops, that's shut down the cluster. Uh, we want to start cluster. So I do everything in one shot. Because the server running this has geode in its class path, I can just call the command gfish. And then gfish, you can start locators. You saw me stop a server, so you can do certain things. I basically inlined everything for a whole cluster just to sort of happen in this one shell script. Um, now, what's interesting is when you look at this sample, you're going to see I'm doing everything with shell. I have some customers that do everything with Ansible. Um, there's a lot of different approaches that you can do to basically manage your distributed system. And essentially, you're, you're calling GFish or, or you know, manipulating this running geo Java process on your distributed system. What's exciting is Pivotal Cloud Foundry will soon have a Gemfire service. So what I can do is take that historic client application and push it up to the, the platform. And in the manifest, say, this needs a Gemfire cluster to run. I need it to have two locators, four servers. Here's the configuration. And the platform will actually start up the cluster and manage the life cycle of it. So that is going to make Gemfire much more easier and less difficult to manage, because basically the platform will worry about all that. So as soon as that GA is, I'm going to update this sample so you can actually run it in the platform. But for now, when you explore the configurations, you'll see that there's, you know, I'm doing everything with shell. So we've got um, the cluster running. So let's start up the client application. So I'm going to start client app. So this, again, is a Spring Boot application. Um, so similar to the historic, it imports an XML, which is going to connect to the cluster. And it has an embedded Tomcat. And if we actually refresh this, we actually see an application. And I'm going to zoom out a bit here, because this resolution is crazy. Just so we can see the whole thing here. So this is our application. Um, so a couple of things are going on. Um, this piece is actually pulling the server. So it's pulling Gemfire and getting a count of open orders. These systems, these little modules, they're actually calling functions and having the functions do uh, sort of counting and grouping on the server side and then return back aggregates. Uh, and we'll take a look at that for a second in a second. But if I want to place an order, I can click Place Order. So the idea of this is this entire application is uh, using Geode as its data store. So when you have an in-memory cache, you can do cool things like after a few keystrokes, you can auto-complete and iterate through a really large um, set of, of data. And then if we take a look at customer, I can do the same thing. So there's all the people. Kelvin, we'll just order Kelvin three shoes. Order's complete. I can view the order profile. So you'll see there's a transaction score. This transaction score is actually sort of a, a, a score based on how the user spent money on the store over the year. The higher the score, the lower their retail price. So I do that calculation. I offload that onto the server. So let's take a look at that in a second. But as you can see, you know, this is performing just like any other application. I have controllers, which I'll show you in a second, that use the repositories that talk to Geode. It's, and what's nice, why I like working with key value, is there's no ORM mapping. I just I have the objects I'm working on in my application. I put them in a geode. I get them back. So it's 
I think it's a much more streamlined way to work. So let's take a look at a couple of things. This is the server-side logic. So this is running on Geode. And what this does is if a client calls this function, and how they call it is just with this interface. So if you take a look at this interface, um, the interface is called order counter caller, and it's got some annotations here. So it's on region transaction. So when this is deployed to the server and a client calls this function, the server says, OK, every member that hosts entries for this transaction region is going to execute this function. Um, and there's one method I've defined. The function ID is count transactions. It takes a customer object, and it returns a list of integers. So let's take a look at what that looks like. So basically, you know, um, without getting too much into this, this is what count transaction looks like. Basically, using my transaction repository, I can find completed orders, and then I can iterate through. And based on so how it works is if it's their birthday, so they get a point for every open order that year. But if there's an order on their birthday, they get an extra point. And if they do more than three transactions in a day, they get another extra point. So it's kind of more of a count and less of, well, it's more of a score and less of a count. But what's cool is this is actually going to operate on the distributed system. Um, so I have test cases to show you how you know, these can be used. So if you look at this test function, I actually have like the test case itself spins up a mini cluster and executes the function. So that's a good way to learn how it works. But even better is if you go into the application, and actually see where it's used. So if we look into the application, if you go into this um, uh, customer controller, what you'll see is there's this populate model. And you'll see in the data service, I have this function called, um, so I have this transaction data service. And I basically get a transaction count on the customer, and it returns an array of results. And that array of results, I actually total up to be that score. And let's take a look at that service. Um, so if you go here to the transaction data service, and this is all in GitHub, so you can explore this later yourself, because I'm kind of going a little bit fast. But you'll see I've got this get transaction count. And I basically, all I'm doing is I'm calling that order caller. So I'm just calling that interface, that method, and I'm passing a customer object. And because I've got that client cache bootstrapped in, and this is kind of, as a client, it's almost like a member of the distributed system, Spring will do all the boilerplate code to actually make the call to the server and tell the server to execute this function. All I need to worry about is every member that did that complex count is going to return. So what the cluster will do is, is capture all those results and then return it to me in a list. So I have a list of integers, and I just have to total it up. Because that's the complex count. Because remember, the data is spread across all the members. So I'm really leveraging the computing power of a bunch of machines and my very lightweight client to do something cool. And um, you know, I didn't really, the programming model was quite, quite simple. So that, that's a little bit of that. Um, let's make things a little bit more interesting before I wrap up. Um, so what I'm going to do is. Start transactions. So what this is is yet another Spring Boot app. You're probably noticing a theme. Um, so what it does is it connects to the cluster, and it shoots 25 transactions every um, five seconds. And what you'll see here is the UI begins to do things. So you'll notice the chart is updating. These totals are updating. So my app is kind of hammering on Geo getting those counts. But you'll see this is appearing here in the bottom. So it's telling me that certain items are running low on stock. This is a really cool thing. So what's happening here is this client registered an interest with Geo. It told Geo I'm interested in all the product region. So if anything in the product region changes, I want to know about it. And then what I did is created a listener on the client side to say, hey, if this product that just got pushed to me, if the quantity is below a certain amount, throw it on a WebSocket. And then this little boot app basically is pulling the WebSocket to give these. So what this allows is anyone in the world can connect to the cluster, order a bunch of product, 
And I can be in a critical situation with a customer and be like, oh gosh, you're about to buy those shoes where they're about to run out of stock. So let's quickly do something about that. So it allows me to react to the data sort of as it's changing. So let's quickly order this guy's shoes. There's only 20 left. Let's order 600. So this item was back ordered. So what that means is we placed the order, but the transaction got put into a different region. And what we can do here is I've got, let me just exit out of this. I've got yet another Spring Boot app that all it does is start up and basically, if I can just scroll to the side, it does a select star off that Derby database. And what I'll do is just kind of zoom out here a bit because the resolution is pretty bad. So there you can see the order that I just placed. And I, I can do another one. So I'll do another order. So we'll put this to a different guy. And we'll put, you know, again, too many, 500. So that item's back ordered. And if we run this again, now we have two entries into the database. So basically, every time something is back ordered, Geode, after it accepts it into the in memory cluster, it's writing it to a database. This could be a message broker. This could make a web service call somewhere else. The idea is I've got this scalable in-memory data store, and I was able to you know, easily have it write to something else. And of course, if I had a cache miss, I could be reading in through this Derby database. So the last thing I'll show you just quickly is you know, how those last couple of things were done. So if you want to see how the database write works, um, we've got a transaction listener. Um, Actually, sorry, we've got a cache writer. So the cache writer, your sort of ties to the life cycle of Geode is you basically extend the cache writer for a certain region. You wire this cache writer to the region. And then you define methods. So before create, before, oh, so I do that twice. It should be before create and before update. Looks like I did the same method twice. I'll have to fix that up. But, um, what happens is, either on the create or the update, when that object goes in, I have a DAO that runs to basically write that in. And if we look at the DAO, data access object, this is just a simple Spring JDBC support that just does SQL inserts into the database. So no problem there. Um, so that's, you know, that's kind of the server-side logic. You can check that out. Um, an interesting thing to note there's a reference helper that you'll see. And these are stored as PDX instances. And when you get it back as a client, you can get it back as your object type, or you could get it back as a PDX instance. And this is just a convenience class that can take a PDX instance and convert it back to the object type that you were hoping for. Um, and the reason I did this is there's a setting in Geode where you can say read serialized, in which case you're always getting back to PDX instances. Um, so the last thing I wanted to quickly just show you is the configuration for this client app. It's different than the, the client config I used in the model. So the, the transaction simulator and the historic data loader, they're using that client cache that's in the model. This little app we have here, it has its own. And the reason it has its own is because of this section right here. So I basically am doing list, uh, a regular expression interest uh, basically on all the keys of the product region. So anytime there's a change in the product region, remember, this is my client. Anytime there's a change in the product region on the server, it's going to get pushed to my local cache. Now, I know what you're thinking. You know, if you have a terabyte of data on the server, that could really overload this little client app. I could actually add expiration. Uh, I could add a few policies to actually clean things out. But the other thing that happens is there's a listener. So as we, listeners basically is a piece of Java code that I can tie to execution within the life cycle of events within my cache. Um, so if we look at this product listener, what it does 
is I basically say on create or update, I update my WebSocket. And I basically update my WebSocket if the entry that just got pushed to me is less than or equal to a threshold. And that's what's giving me those nice scrolling updates. Now with Gemfire, we have something called continuous query. So you can define a continuous query when, as a client when you register. So rather than me having to get everything and then in Java decide what I want to use, the server actually runs my query. And if the query is met, which is going to filter things out, then it sends me what I need. Because Geo doesn't have continuous query, using listeners and interests, I've kind of created something similar. Um, and I think, that's, I think that's about it. Was there any, anything you wanted to dig into on this sample? Good. OK. Now, I'm just curious, uh, how many people here have worked with Gemfire? OK. How many people have worked with Geode? Cool. Uh, how many people have worked with another in-memory data cache, like Hazelcast, uh, Coherence? OK, cool. How many people work with other key value stores? Cool. So this is a pretty key value crowd. We probably should have started with that question. <laughs> I was thinking. Yeah. Did you get my picture? That's okay. Okay. Uh, so that's the demo. As I said, um, it is a work in progress, but please check out the repo. Everything you need is there. You can just download it and run this whole sort of flow. I've got all the documentation. Now I have a section for AWS. So in AWS, I've actually created the sort of all the members of the cluster running on server, one server and all the client on another. So with two AWS instances, you can actually run this in AWS as well. Um, so I'm going to put the AMIs up in the documentation so you can create your own instances for that. We'll probably do a distributed example of this so you can have multiple. And then when our service comes out in PCF, that's gonna, when it's going to get really cool because then you don't need to worry about managing the cluster. PCF will do that, and you just give it the app. So this will be a, uh, an evolving project. But if something doesn't work, or if you want to see a feature that you would like to see uh, displayed, because I've tried to display everything possible from a Spring point of view, just you know, send me an email, uh, and I'm happy to you know add stuff and update things on this repo. Thank you. Thank you, Luke. <clears throat> We have a bit, a bit more left if you guys want to stick around yet. We've uh, got one more example if you'd like to see that and um, cover some of the new features in Spring Data Gemfire. That won't take too much longer. All right. Shit, that went over. No. Okay. All right. So this, this example won't actually take nearly a question. Yeah, 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 yeah. We'll we'll get to that real quickly. I'm going to move along here pretty quick. So I just want to cover caching real quick. Um, have anybody has anybody here used the Spring Cache abstraction before? Okay, just a few. So as I mentioned before, you can use Apache Geode as a caching provider. Now the caching is useful in situations where you have a really expensive operation, maybe it's CPU bound or I/O bound, and regardless of the input, if those inputs are the same, it always produces the same output. So that's really a good example of when to use caching. And Spring actually offers several different caching annotations on your service methods to make them cacheable. Much like the transaction management infrastructure, it proxies those service methods and applies caching to them. So at cacheable just triggers caching, right? Like if I, if I go in and I want to execute an operation, if that value already exists on the cache based on the operation's inputs, It'll look it up and it'll return the value instead of executing the method. If it doesn't exist, it's going to continue to execute the method. And the result of that will actually be cached. There's similar applications to actually evict an entry, to put data, update um, the cache. So it'll execute the me method regardless of whether the value is in the cache or not. And there's some other convenience annotations. Now, these caching annotations basically correspond to the Jcache annotations. So Spring actually recognizes either one. You can use Spring's caching annotations, or you can use the JSR 107 annotations in place of the Spring cache annotations. Basically, to hook Apache Geode or Pivotal Gemfire in as a caching provider, you just declare a Gemfire cache manager. 
from Spring Data Gemfire, either in Java config or in Spring config, either way, and you enable caching with the caching annotation driven uh, declaration here. Or more conveniently, in Java config, you just use the at enable caching annotation. So let's take a look at a quick example. Hopefully my network connection's still up. All right, so what I've got here is I've got a startup quotes web application. And has anybody here been to startupquotes.com before? Anyone? No? So it's basically just a bunch of entrepreneurs, um, people like Marissa Mayer, uh, startup founders that basically have all these like advice quotes for people that are basically building a startup. And I found somebody who had a GitHub repo that developed a Go web service to actually go out and fetch one of these quotes. So this is a really contrived example, but it demonstrates something that might be I.O. intensive, right? Like I'm making a network hop to go fetch some external data, and that can be kind of expensive. So we might want to cache similar results. So what this application does is it's going to cache a particular author's quote. So if it's accessed again, it'll return the same quote. And I can time that out. Maybe I might want to cache that person's quote for a period of five minutes and then go get a new quote from that person or something like that. So I've got a basic Spring Boot application here. I import my, my Spring Gemfire config. It's, again, it's been expressed in Java config, similar to what I showed you earlier. This is a controller here, so it's just a basic set of web service endpoints. I've got my um, global request mapping, and down here I've got some, um, some request methods. So if you're familiar with Spring's MVC, it's pretty basic here, nothing too fancy. I've got my quote service I've injected, and this is the guy that's actually cacheable. So we're going to take a look at him real quick. He's pretty simple as well. He delegates to a data access object. He's got this random quote that takes a Twitter handle, so it's basically using the author's Twitter handle as the key in my cache, and then it's using the quote as a value. And it basically stores that in the cache quotes. Now, a lot of our customers, they want to completely abstract out Gemfire or Apache Geode or whatever. Caching Spring's cache abstraction is one way to do that besides repositories. The nice thing about repositories is if you use the query methods and you stick to the convention rather than specifying raw queries, those repositories can actually be transferable across data stores. So I could actually literally take my quotes repository and plug it into like say JPA or Mongo or some other database, right? But with the cache abstraction, I can abstract out the underlying data store even further just through caching operations. We've had a few customers that have done that. So basically, I'm going to cache the Twitter handle with the quote um, if it's the same author. And the way the data access object works, it just uses the REST template here. And it goes out to these URLs. So this is the app that I found. It's been hosted on Heroku. It's written in Go. Um, and I've got some, uh, well, it's, it's got some endpoints itself. I take that JSON, it returns JSON, and I wrap it up into a domain object. And then I just populate my view. And that view is actually just a, um, a time leaf template. So let's start up the application. Once again, I got logging termed up here, so uh, you're going to see a bunch of uh, geo logging spit out. And then you'll see all my controller endpoints spit out as well. So now my application should be running. I can jump over to my browser. Hopefully that's all visible. Looks like we're OK. Expand the thing a little bit. So I've just got a basic ping endpoint. Yep, she's online. All right, so I can just hit the first endpoint here. Whoops. And I can get my endpoint right. That would help. And I can just get random quotes. So this one's from Paul Graham. And he's got a quote there. Now, some people have Twitter handles. Some people don't. Um, so this application doesn't quite handle all situ situations. But it's just a simple example to demonstrate the caching here. So this wasn't a cache hit because this value wasn't in memory. But just remember this quote. So I'm just going to cycle it a little bit. Every time. I refresh this, it's going to grab a new quote from a different person, and so on and so forth. And each of those are going to be cache myth misses. But if I go back to any particular author, say Paul, and I grab a quote, and I refresh that one, now it's just going to start 
returning that same quote because I've already cached that value from Paul. So it registered as a cache hit. This is a little bit big now, especially given the size of the quote. There we go. So you can see that that's a cache hit. And I can do that for every single person. And on my particular entries, I can set an expiration policy, like say five minutes, as I mentioned. And then after five minutes, the entry will time out. The, the cache miss will occur. It'll again execute to perform the operation, go fetch a new value. Pretty simple. There's certainly a lot more complex use cases for Spring caching, but this kind of just demonstrates using Apache Geode as a caching provider in Spring's cache abstraction. It's real simple to actually test this application too. Um, I'll show you what that looks like real quick since I have it up. So I just got a basic test method here that logs stuff. It's gonna use my exact same configuration. So nothing's different than the Spring Boot application. I can plug in the same stuff using the Spring test context annotations. And all it's gonna do is it's gonna go out and grab a quote. It's gonna assert that that is um, uh, a cache miss the first time I access it. It's gonna access, again, the same person and expect that to be a cache hit. And then just go out and grab, grab somebody random and make sure that's a cache miss again. So if I run that test, I would expect that to pass. But first, I need to shut down my application so I don't run into any more port conflicts. Okay, and I can just run my test. Real simple way to actually test whether your configuration is correct, whether you're integrated properly with uh, Spring, um, with Spring Data Gemfire, with Apache Geode or Pivotal Gemfire, um, and so on. And this cache, I mean, in this particular situation, oh yeah, I still have logging turned up because it's using the same configuration. So you'll see that my, um, my output here was intermixed with the log statements, but I can turn logging back down and I can just see that output. So I got some simple log statements in it so you can see that that happened and that my test passed. Simple to, uh, to test as well. All right, wrapping up real fast. Okay, my laptop's in a funky state. There we go. All right. So what's new in Spring Data Gemfire? Did I miss one there? Nope, okay. We have annotation-based expiration. So rather than configuring the values on the region itself, there's actually something in Apache Geode and Pivotal Gemfire called a custom expiry. You can define your own expiration policies. And so what Spring Data Gemfire does is it implements that interface and provides a means to be able to do that directly on your application domain objects. So up above here, you can see I have an application domain object. I have annotations for at time to live, as well as idle timeout. And the attribute values consist of timeouts and the action that you want to occur. You can either invalidate entries, destroy them. Um, and those attributes actually can take either spell expressions or property placeholders. So they can become very configurable at that point. So you can see here in my partition region example, I've actually added the annotation-based expiration custom expiry. That's the interface in Gemfire. So you just add that to either your time to live expiration policy or your TTI, which you can define externally as a bean and you can even provide defaults. So some default expiration attributes there. There's a lot of different ways to configure it. You can go to the Spring Data Gemfire documentation and see more examples and more specific on how that works. We have annotation-based query OQL extensions now. So in Luke's demo, you saw that he used at query annotation. There he was actually specifically specifying raw OQL. And you kind of want to stay away from that as much as possible. But in certain situations, it's, it's not possible to avoid raw OQL. For instance, if you're doing a complex join, using the repository abstraction, you're tied to one specific domain object. So it's a little bit harder to express a complex join. So that's a situation where you might need a raw OQL. But for the most part, all simple queries that have simple values you know, those values can be expressed as method parameters and there's placeholders in your query. Spring Data Gemfire handles all of that. In addition to those things, we have things like at trace annotation. So you can enable logging for all OQL queries in Gemfire by setting a system property. But maybe a more convenient way to do it is actually just to add the at trace annotation on the specific queries that you want to actually log. That way you're not getting logging for every single query. There's a limit here, so that's not expressed in the convention of the name. 
but you can set limits in terms of the result sets that are returned. Import is very QL specific. Um, if you have like say multiple customer objects, you have an XYZ customer, an ABC customer object in your application, sometimes Gemfire requires you, or Pivotal Geo, or excuse me, Apache Geo requires you to resolve or to qualify the actual domain type, and this is the way you can do it now. And then you can provide query hints, so you can specify which indexes might be actually applicable to your queries. Finally, there's a new snapshot export import uh, service support in Spring Data Gemfire. So one of the requests is, you know, like if you have, if you're using Bean profiles and you have embedded data sources, you just want to load up some data into your application real quickly. This is basically Spring Data Gemfire's equivalent to that. I might have some export from, say, a production application or a test environment, and I want to, in development, I want to reproduce an issue. I can get that snapshot either as a directory um, or a zip file. So by default, Apache Geo doesn't support zip files, but in Spring Data Gemfire, I added support to make sure that it supports a zip file, because most likely, you're going to dump a bunch of data, you're going to zip up all the files, and you're going to just send it off to another environment. So you can just drop that zip file in there, put a reference to it, and you can import that data. Likewise, you can export data, um, and you can actually create filters in terms of what data is actually imported or exported. And you can target it at the entire cache or specific regions. Okay, so just a few references here. Uh, our slides will be up online. I'll actually post them to my SlideShare account. I'm sure there's going to be a general Spring 1 uh, location where all slides will be going. The examples for uh, both Luke and I's source code is at GitHub. These will be the references. So when you get these slides, all these links in here are linkable. You can just click on them and go to them. Uh, whew, just lost my connection, too, it looks like. All right, so... Some Apache Geo references, you can go to the project page, you can find out about more community events, ways to get involved. This is a brand new Apache project, so it's a perfect opportunity for people to contribute if you want to get involved in open source. Uh, there's a page there that gives you some ideas in terms of what the community and specifically the team are looking for uh, in terms of contributions. And if you have your own ideas, anything's welcome here. We got, Yep, you can add to the demos, you can fork those things, any of the code, play with it. If you have questions, you can reach us on Twitter or via email. And of course, you can look at documentation, source code online, report tickets through JIRA, ask questions on Stack Overflow. I'm a very active Stack Overflow user, so I monitor that regularly. Here are the same references for Spring Data Gemfire. And you can stay connected by checking out some of the other sessions here. There's one on booting your search with Spring by Chris... Christoph Strobel at uh, noon today, right after lunch, in this same room. And then later this afternoon, there's one by Roy Clarkson and Greg Turnquist on using the Spring Data REST abstraction. So if you're creating repositories and you want to make your application RESTful, this is a great talk to be able to determine how to take those repositories and turn them into REST interfaces. Okay. And that's pretty much it. So we can stick around for a little bit if people have questions, and you're welcome to ask questions right now. Thank you.